quick uh, introduction from me then. Uh, my name's Kim Clark. I'm an integration architect and strategist at IBM, um, focused on the integration space generally. Uh, I've been working in integration for, well, probably about 20 years now. Um, that's uh, uh, shocking to admit that. And um, so I've seen uh, integration landscapes change pretty dramatically over that time. Um, <clears throat> and what I was going to focus on today is obviously we're at an API conference. Um, uh, the, you know, the world has been talking about APIs and the API economy for a long time. Um, but the focus has always been you know, largely on the synchronous style of APIs, RESTful APIs. Um, and we're starting to see a resurgence in the use of events um, and asynchronous messaging. And so it's to bring the, the sort of question around, um, should we be looking at those as APIs as well? And if we do, then what does that mean in terms of how we expose those? So let's take a look through at, um, I'm going to take, kind of take a little step backwards. I know we're at an API conference. I know you guys obviously all know what APIs are. Um, we, you know, we've got an example here of an API implementation. It could be a microservice application. It could be a legacy application exposed by an integration layer. Uh, but typically, when we're exposing that to another domain, we'd expose that through an API gateway. Uh, we don't want to burden the implementation itself with how we're exposing that API to a broader audience. And this is really, you know, sort of building up to looking at you know, what does API management really mean? Um, that gateway is handling the traffic management, the security, perhaps some translation of the API as well, and so on. Um, we'd expect to see a developer portal um, uh, providing the, our ability to find APIs and, and self-service subscribe to those APIs. And then finally, some, we've got to find somewhere where we actually define those APIs in the background. And so we, you know, we, we bring uh, Swagger definitions or open API definitions to an API manager. And that's the thing that populates the portal and configures the gateway for us. And so, you know, what I've described there is, is API management as we see it today, typically for uh, uh, REST APIs and possibly web services and things like that as well. That's how we expose APIs outside of, a, of an industry boundary. But as I mentioned at the beginning, um, although in microservice applications especially, um, we see a popularity of synchronous APIs, um, and the focus on, on this idea of synchronous communication, um, there's an increasing uh, uh, popularity for event-based communication between microservices as well. Um, microservice applications especially need this decoupling. It's part of what a microservice application is designed to do. You've broken it up into smaller pieces, and in the very act of doing that, you want the decoupling. And a, an, an API is a real-time communication between two things. A RESTful API or a synchronous API is a real-time communication. Um, whereas we're you know, hoping to get um, uh, uh, more decoupled than that, and so events have become very popular. And I'm going to, as we go on through the presentation, talk a bit more about what kind of patterns we're starting to see emerging for the use of events in the microservices um, um, communications and things as well. But further than that, it's not just um, asynchronous communication between microservices themselves. Um, we've also probably got systems of record uh, that are containing key data. And although the microservice application probably has its own data, um, the systems of record that live around the organization with all the different, you know, it could be order management and fulfillment and shipping and invoicing and all those different capabilities that you've got around the organization also contain critical data and we'll no doubt have exposed those. So through phases of service orientated architecture, perhaps exposing web services and, and, and more recently through API management internally as well. And so we've got microservices potentially consuming APIs um, from backend systems. And that means that they've got a real-time dependency on that backend system's availability, on its performance. And so that's a significant concern. Can that backend system handle the load that's now being put onto it via these APIs? 
And so we're starting to see a significant move towards not only having an API mechanism to expose things, but also an event mechanism to expose things as well. And starting to see that as being an alternative type of API. Now, to be fair, many um, many companies supplying an API do already provide API uh, events, but they often provide them through a RESTful API. So there'll be a polling mechanism where you get the next set of events through a RESTful API. What we're talking about here, here is moving to a first class way of exposing events. And we're starting to see that in the form of async API as a standard. Um, and and, um, uh, and uh, technologies like Kafka, which we're going to talk about later, bringing certain things to the party, but many other aspects besides. Um, I'm just checking back to um, uh, check the chat. Um, I'm not going to be able to see it whilst I'm presenting, but if people do have any questions as we're going along, I will check in on the chat every uh, 10 minutes or so and uh, see if I can answer your questions as we go. Um, so if we're going to have um, uh, those APIs being exposed, then API management is going to start looking somewhat different. It's going to be API and event management, perhaps, or maybe we're going to call it something like multi-form API management. It's going to have to have a mechanism for uh, um, exposing more things than we have today. And I'm going to come to a bit more detail towards the end of the presentation as to what I think event management looks like as a, as a capability. Uh, before we do that, let's just reinforce this idea of where we expect to see that event and API management taking place. Um, so in a large organization with lots of microservice applications, those microservice applications are really groups of microservices. It's not just a broad, uh, um, a broad landscape of thousands of, of microservices. They are grouped into things that we might call applications still, even though they don't sit in a siloed application like they used to. And it's on the boundaries of those applications that we'd expect to see APIs being exposed. And it's, it's there that we'd expect to see this API and event management as well. And so what the point I'm trying to get at here is really that we don't expect to see API management being used between microservices in an application. Um, we expect to see it only on the boundary we might use other things to control the communication within a boundary, things like a service mesh, for example. But once you're on the boundary of a domain or a bounded context, to use words from sort of domain-driven design, that's where you expect to see the event, uh, the API and event management. So if that's where you see API management, that's where you're going to see event management too. And so this is really just scoping where we'd expect to see this new capability of event management. Um, this is an example, a, a sort of reference architecture, if you like, from a, a number of different retail clients that I've spoken to. Um, you can only tell that it's a retail client because we've got stores, uh, so actual retail stores on the left there. Um, <clears throat> lots of information being generated as events that is less suited to APIs. Lots of, of, of um, information about sales in the stores, uh, information about replenishment, information about all sorts of things that are happening through that, that retail site. Um, that needs to permeate its way through to the back-end systems on-premise and potentially up into multiple clouds. Um, you can see there with the, you know, that, that we've got the API and event management in place there in, in, in the edge of all of those applications. But what's really going on in the background is an infrastructure of uh, asynchronous communication. And I've deliberately included two different types here. So the event log that I've got on the right-hand side um, would refer to something like Kafka. Um, Kafka would be enabling you to publish and subscribe events um, within one domain and replicate that domain to another domain as well if you needed to. So that publish and subscribe on topics. But of course, this idea of passing information asynchronously is far from new. Um, and we've had messaging capabilities, message queuing capabilities for, for multiple decades. 
Um, and so we'll also likely see that in use as well. And these, the, the, the messaging capabilities have different flavors and different capabilities to the, what we're today typically calling events. But really, you know, you could be passing things that look like events over messaging or over Kafka, um, and you might be joining to them together in certain ways as well. So um, most customers I speak to have a hybrid landscape which is a mixture of messaging and events. And so, you know, Kafka representing the more typical of modern events, if you like, um, and then messaging doing the, the uh, more transactional events. And so what I'd like to do then is take a quick step back and say, well, what's the difference between these two? Because people starting new projects um, shouldn't be assuming that, you know, yes, I'll always choose, choose Kafka because that's the, the newest and shiniest thing. Um, they might be looking at messaging as well, and we need to, understand the differences between them. So comparing the two, this is, I mean, we could we could put a much bigger chart up than this with lots of differences between messaging and events. Um, but you know, this is a set of six things that really do help us to uh, um, separate the two. Um, towards the left-hand side there, we've got critical data exchange, which is really talking about the ability to deliver something once and once only, probably transactionally as well, maybe in a two-phase commit transaction. Um, and, and that capability is pretty unique to messaging. The, the, that kind of transactionality is not available in event streaming platforms like Kafka, for example. It has a form of transactionality, but it's not that one. Conversational messaging is referring to things like request re reply uh, messaging. Um, so doing what you might normally do over you know, HTTP uh, REST requests, but doing it, say, over messaging because you need that, that permanent storage of the messages or, or you need that longer term, uh, longer lived uh, messages. Um, that, again, is something that you, although you can kind of achieve it in Kafka, it would be unwise. You're more likely to do that over something like messaging. From from my background, I work for IBM, so you know our, our messaging capability is IBM MQ, and so I always think of those, especially those two left-hand use cases, as fitting squarely with a messaging capability like MQ. Um, Fine-grained event topics is again something that in the messaging territory you can have sort of message hierarchies, and they can be quite dynamic, and so that's something again unique to messaging. But then when we talk about more generically about topics, coarse grain topics, Kafka, of course, has topics. Um, the topics are burnt into its infrastructure. So, you, you know, you have partitions that are specific areas of disk on each, each of the brokers. Um, and, and they represent, they're, they're part of the way that it gets the high performance that it does is having these coarse grain partitions. So it certainly has topics. Um, but the cut topics are quite coarse grained and they're quite um, uh, they're, they're not particularly dynamic you know there's something that, that that's fairly set up in the infrastructure um, and then we move across then to uh, and so these areas sort of overlap scalable subscription as well being able to scale up the number of consumers that you have there's differences between the two in, in how consumer groups are handled which is quite interesting um, and then as you move right across to the right-hand side, there's this unique feature to events, which is stream history. So whilst you can have permanent messages in, in, in a queue, most uh, messaging environments will say that, you know, a, a deep queue is a bad queue. We want empty queues. Empty queues are good queues. Whereas with eventing, we have an event log and stream history is another word for it, which effectively keeps that log of, of messages. And so we're in a good position now, I think, now that we've separated messaging from events to see what sort of patterns we're seeing with these stream history, but also to recognize that um, uh, some of the event use cases can be achieved with messaging as well. And so we've got a balancing it between those two. So let's focus on the right-hand side, and, and fairly specifically, actually, I'm going to look at the um, at the patterns that have been coming back to the surface. They're not new patterns, but they've been coming back to the surface um, as a result of um, making use of that event history. Um, <clears throat> um, I'm just checking a question, which is a which is an interesting one. 
Um, okay, and so I think what we're saying here is um, that there's a, a lot of layers of abstraction in what I'm describing with something like the API management. I think that's where that's coming from. So if you've only got a, a sort of, you know, a fairly small company with a, a certain number of implementers and, and architects and so on, um, would they be able to support all these different layers? I think it's fair to say that um, at the outside edge of a company where you're exposing things to other companies, you're almost always going to need API management at that layer of the company um, for security reasons, traffic management, and so on. Are you going to need um, API management, and as we'll go on to talk about event management, um, between different areas of, the, of that smaller company? Possibly not. So I think that's perhaps the, the, uh, where this comes in. If you're in a large company, then you know, different parts of that company may need the levels of abstraction, even internally. If you're in a smaller company, possibly only at the edge of the, at the, edge of the organization. Hopefully, I've picked up on the right aspect of that question. Um, so, looking at event streams, um, as I say, uh, as a as event streams and this event history as being um, something that's brought some existing patterns to the surface again. So, here's your basic pattern. This is basically what Kafka does. Um, so, I'm taking Kafka as an example. It's the most predominant one. It's not the only one, um, but uh, it has an event log. Um, that allows you to um, place events as they occur in a back-end system. Um, and applications can listen to those uh, and, and subscribe to those topics. That's basic public subscribe. You could do this with queues, but of course, you wouldn't then end up with an event log at the end. You, you drain the queues as you, as you um, subscribe to the information. Um, so let's move on and, and look at another pattern. Event processing is something that is quite popular, um, is this idea that, OK, so I've got this event history. What could I do with that event history? Um, could I start to spot patterns on it? Could I do filtering? Could I produce another topic that perhaps has redacted fields from the first topic and so on? And so that's that's a you know a quite common use of the event history, because by definition, we've got this history or at least a window of that history that we can use. That's almost a whole other presentation to discuss all the different use cases in event processing. But I'm going to go down another path. I'm going to go back to the um, publish and subscribe aspect again and start to look at patterns on top of that. So we've got this event log. And what about if instead of just listening to events as they occur, we decided to store the events in a type of cache like a local data store close to our application. So the back-end system might be an old system of record um, that we are listening to events from. Um, it might have the data in the wrong format for us. It might uh, um, have too much data for us. Uh, it, 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 going back to what we are discussing at the beginning of the presentation, it might not be able to cope with the load of us asking for information from that back-end data store through an API. Um, it might not have the availability that we need. And so by making sure all of the changes turn up in an event log, and then each of our applications subscribing to the event log and building an application-specific data store, that provides us with this event stream projections pattern, where we effectively got a cache of the data from the back-end data store that we can access immediately uh, with the, the performance that we need and so on. It is a form of caching. There's no getting away from that. This is not, you know, not a brand new pattern by any means. Um, some caches, you know, Hazelcast and things like that, work in uh, can work in this way by listening to a stream off of Kafka. You could also be building you know, your own unique data store in Mongo or something like that. Now let's build on this pattern a little bit further because this comes to another application pattern that's very common, um, and this is known as event sourcing. Now you may think I'm taking a fairly circuitous route around what I'm uh, talking about here, but I'm going to come back to that idea of event management and things in the end. I just want to establish what these patterns are first, and then we'll come back to that. So event sourcing is this idea that for an application, so the, the, the dotted boundary is an application, instead of having a database, a traditional SQL database or even a NoSQL database, the only thing I have is an event log. 
that's actually the whole uh, that's my that's my whole um, data source and if I want to read data from my data source then I either go and look at the event log directly which will give me the individual events or I do what the pattern we had on the previous slide I create a projection in a local data store a cache if you like of, of the the data in the event source and I can use that to create some really low latency responses perhaps very complex responses, perhaps joining multiple topics together and things like that. Um, and those can happen immediately without having to perform uh, queries and things across the event log itself. And that might be more performant than having had a data store and having to do complex queries against that data store. Now, those of you that know a fair bit about the history of databases will recognize that this, you know, this, some, some databases work this way, right? If you start talking about materialized views and things like that, you know, you, you, can, you, you can do these kind of things actually within a database. And a database actually, although you think it stores things in tables um, and rows in tables and things like that, actually most databases do have a transaction log sitting underneath that which looks a lot like an event log so in a way we're almost turning the innards of the database inside out and saying we want to do that more explicitly and we want to have our own control over building these local data stores and controlling the event log and for some applications some applications this is a useful pattern it's sometimes known as cqrs um, and uh, you know, with bringing events onto the log, so we're making um, data changing requests coming onto the log, those are the commands coming in, um, and those could be exposed over an API, so you might not ever see that Kafka is the implementation behind the scenes. So from the outside of the application, you might only interact through APIs, an API to send things onto the event log, another one to read things from these data stores. To the consumer, it just looks like a you know any other application that has a data store. They have no idea whether it's Kafka or, or or any number of different data stores. And CQRS is command query responsibility segregation. So what we're doing is separating the commands on the left from the query on the right, um, so that we can really optimize those queries. That's the usual prime motivation here is to optimize the queries, but it could also be to optimize the the the, um, uh, uh, the the inbound side as well. Okay, so that's event sourcing and CQRS. They're kind of related and almost the same pattern. One is kind of the implementation, the other is the underlying data store. So why did I bring this pattern to the surface? Well, this has become very popular in microservice environments. You can imagine those blue boxes being some of the microservices within a broader application, and they're highly decoupled. So we could make changes in a read implementation A, for example, to an extent that we could completely change the data model that's being used in implementation A, um, and we could rebuild that local data store from the event log. Because if all the events are there, then I could just trash the current data store and rebuild it. And that means that I don't have to migrate anything. I don't have to migrate code to a new, um, new model. I can actually just rebuild the data store from the event log. So quite powerful, really, really not decoupling, not just from a runtime point of view, which we've, of course, got because we're asynchronous, but decoupling from a, a design point of view and an architectural point of view as well. So it's a, it's a very powerful pattern from that perspective. I should add the warning that it's a pretty complex pattern as well. And um, so you need to make sure that you are choosing it for, um, for something that's worth it, something that really has the need for this kind of pattern. So let's draw back. We're going to get back to where we started at the beginning of the presentation soon. So let's zoom out and say, say somebody's using that pattern, that, that um, CQRS pattern, um, to uh, write uh, an application that sits within a bounded context. Um, we would expect to see um, an API management, as we did on that previous diagram, uh, an API management capability, perhaps. Um, exposing between one bounded context and another. As to the question earlier, you know, it, even if you don't have a full API management capability, for sure you want to at least have a good, um, a, a good abstraction layer, even if it's not a deep abstraction layer um, between two applications. It might be nothing more than the ingress on your 
um, service mesh or something like that. Um, but you certainly want to have something there. And it's equally true um, for events. So if we started saying we want to expose events from this banded context, we certainly shouldn't be exposing the banded context event log. That would be against the rules of encapsulation in applications, if you like. We'd expect to put some kind of translation layer there. So we'd expect to see the event log um, exposed through some kind of abstraction layer. As again, again, it might not be a deep abstraction layer, but enough for those events to be um, translated perhaps to a different data model, maybe even exposed over a different protocol. Um, it may be that we don't want to expose Kafka directly. We want to expose things over some other format. And so this is where we're starting to get to that, you know, between bounded contexts, we've always had asynchronous messages passing between them. But if we start to say um, that we want to do that in a more formalized way and govern it in the same way we would APIs, um, then we need to think about how we'd do that. Um, I'm just having a quick check of the questions. I think there's a nice dialogue going on there. So I'll let that one continue while I continue on um, with uh, what I'm discussing here. Um, so I'm going to stay, take a step back and, and uh, like, if you like, another few thousand feet and say, well, okay, so we've got on the left-hand side, that's our example of the CQRS pattern at work inside an application, as I described it a few slides back. On the right-hand side, I've got something that looks like the CQRS pattern. But it's questionable as to whether it is, because actually we've got things going between different applications in the enterprise. And so instead of, I've, I've got, you know, uh, um, and, and that, the, just to make this a bit more real, the one on the right hand side is actually born off of speaking to a number of customers who have that retail scenario. So this is retail customers, for example, um, who have point of sale systems. So that's what's up in the command store. Um, and uh, that's passing information back into the back end systems. Um, and so they need some way of, uh, of controlling what events are available to the back end systems. They might need some kind of event management there. And as we again expose things from that back end system, which might be an order processing system or a, 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 an invoicing system or whatever, that then needs to have events being exposed that could be used by shipping systems and, 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 and the like as well. Um, and so that's where event management potentially fits in on the right. And it's doing exactly the same kind of things as we would have seen API management doing in the past. It's, it's covering those boundaries. And quite often, I, I mean, this is kind of a, a slight tangent, but I quite often speak to companies who say they're doing CQRS. They say they're using that pattern. But when we start digging into it, we see that the messages and the events are actually moving between radically different domains within the organization. And actually, <coughs> they're not doing that tightly constrained CQRS pattern that really would be happening in one bounded context. They're actually doing something that is spread across an organization and across multiple different units and pieces of the organization. And if you are doing that, then we probably should be thinking differently about how those events are exposed between those different um, domains. And that's where we come to talking about um, potentially doing event management as well as API management. So this is just one example. Um, I wanted to sort of talk about an, a, a pattern that is somewhat unique to events so that we could you know, bring this into a bit of context there. But, but you know, to be honest, we could be talking about any communication between different um, domains within an organization uh, and, and saying, well, you know, how does this affect uh, the way that me uh, events and messages are being uh, communicated between those. Okay, so um, let's drop in now to have a bit of a conversation about what event endpoint management might look like. And, um, and uh, you know, full disclosure here, I work for IBM. Part of the reason I'm interested in this is because we are bringing to market something um, that, that, that achieves event endpoint management. Um, but, you know, I'm humble enough to know we're not the only people in the industry doing that. So I think it's good to open a discussion around um, uh, what, what event endpoint management ought to look like, what sort of things it should cover, and what sort of standards we might be following in, in, in the industry. 
Um, so it's, it's very much along the same lines as you'd expect for API management. So um, in the same way that uh, you know, APIs need to uh, um, expose data in a way that's sufficiently accessible uh, and, and uh, e easily available, but also low latency, um, events need to do that too. And that's more about your implementation under the covers, making sure that the events that are arriving at the event gateway are arriving soon enough. Um, that you can consume it reliably. Now, reliable could mean many things here, but um, you know, there's sort of two approaches to reliability in the asynchronous domain. You can either have a, a, a well-controlled transactional delivery of messages, as we've done with things like messaging capabilities in the past, um, or you can say there will be a history, a history available, and um, you, you know, as a consumer, you can take on the burden of making sure you read an event only once, uh, making sure that you do read the event, um, and you can take on that burden of, of transactionality. And that's really the approach that, that Kafka and event history-based things take on. And then moving to um, the, the next level is then saying, well, okay, so we've got these events that have been surfaced. They've been surfaced in a timely manner. Um, they can be consumed reliably, reliably because the infrastructure enables that. Um, how do I find them? What's available in my organization? And you know, this feels like a, a massive deja vu, I think, to anybody who was around uh, sort of 15 years ago talking about service oriented architecture and discussing uh, service registries or anybody who was moving into using APIs um, 10 years ago and starting to talk about what API management was bringing to the table. Because it's really about, you know, could I have a registry or a portal that allows me to find things really easily? Um, across the organization so I can see, for example, if already there is something that exposes exactly the set of events that I need and start to get some, some sort of reuse um, of the things that are there, cataloged in a discoverable way, and of course controlled through policy. So not everybody can see all the events. Um, maybe they can't see certain topics. Maybe they can only see topics that show a, a filtered set of the events and so on. And then moving to completely decoupling the uh, consumer and provider, um, the provider of the events might be bringing events out on MQ uh, messaging. The, pro the, the consumer of the events might prefer to read them through a Kafka interface. They might prefer to read them over a WebSocket. They might like the idea of a webhook. Okay, so how are we going to train, uh, uh, how are we going to make that available? How are we going to sort out that sort of change? And uh, we can sort of break down each one of these uh, in a little more detail here. So the describing of the events, only in recent years have, has the industry really settled on a standard for this. So async API is based off of um, the uh, open API specification. It's, it's you know, born from the same, same concepts. Um, and um, so, you know, the, the files are, you know, YAML files that are, that are fairly easy to read in from a human perspective, but they're also supported by reading from tooling. Um, and, you know, they've got some, some precedents in being used in what were Swagger documents, what are now open API documents. Um, so it's born off of the back of that, but catering to asynchronous API, um, growing standard that's been taking on various different forms over recent years. And so now we've got a mechanism that's agreed more or less across the industry. And again, it's not the only one, but it is a very popular one. Um, I'm just going to check back in the chat, see if there's any new questions come in. I don't see anything at the moment. Um, and then moving to that discoverability. So um, being able to search for events, there's things we can do. There's some of these things are different to APIs. So you can imagine you want to surface um, a catalog of APIs um, with events because you could potentially listen to and cache those events. You could not only be searching for um, the definitions of events, but you could potentially be searching through sample data to see if the to, to see what the uh, events actually look like when they come out. In the same way that in API management, you know, you might have a facility for testing an API and seeing some, some, some data come back from that. So there are some things we can do 
with an event stream and event history that we perhaps couldn't do uh, in, in in the portal for APIs, um, and and that makes you know that makes this path to making things available quite interesting. Um, and then looking at uh, decentralized access, and really here we're you know back to the principle of we we you know we don't want to have to have a central team of event distribution experts um, that would be you know in the api terms that would be going back to having centralized enterprise service buses um, and centralized teams looking after those enterprise service buses in the api world we're trying to move to more um, decentralization of that integration so that the individual applications expose their own apis and they administer those and make them available to other teams and those people looking after those applications don't want to have to get involved necessarily in administering people's use of those APIs, and nor would they want to get involved in administering people's use of events. So they'll put the event out there, they'll make it available in the catalog, but they would like it that a consumer can come along and say, yes, I'd like to make use of these particular pieces, these particular events, I'll subscribe to them myself, and I'll get the details I need for the Kafka protocol or the webhook protocol or whatever it might be. Um, what they do perhaps want to be able to do, though, is track the use. So um, both the consumer of the events and the, the provider would want to be able to track usage. It might be that they're even charged over that usage, depending if this is an external uh, event or, or not. So there might be some monetization in the same way that we monetize APIs. And then going alongside that, of course, the team exposing those events need the controls to be able to say who can see the events, which events they can see, some sort of role-based access. They need to be able to, to, to stop people from being able to see events if they suddenly discover that a partner they're working with, um, they're not comfortable with the way they're using that data, then they need to be able to stop access to that event to be immediately. So those kind of controls need to be available as well. But being able to do that in a decoupled way, so that you know you're 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 um, uh, separated from the two sides in a decentralized way, rather. And then finally, we can look at this idea of decoupled. And this, as I was referring to earlier, is really about saying: Does the consumer of the events really want to see the events in the way that you are surfacing them internally? So it might be that you're surfacing them directly onto a Kafka queue. One particular consumer um, that's, that's, I don't know, building a data warehouse or a Hadoop, Hadoop um, data store might want to just suck in a fire hose of events from, from Kafka. Uh, an, another, um, a, a, another consumer might prefer to receive these as events that are guaranteed delivery over a messaging protocol um, so that they can perhaps be sent to uh, uh, um, different, uh, um, perhaps out to, to uh, different environments that require that kind of transactional delivery. Something else might be saying, well, could you convert this into a polling API? And there might be some need to do that. So there could be radically different types of consumers sitting on that side. Um, we might want to do some kind of data transformation and enrichment as well, just as we sometimes do with APIs. So we might expose an industry standard data model um, to consumers of the API, but internally we might not be using that data model, or we might be using a subset of it, or we might be using a different flavor of it. So we need to translate between those two. Um, of course, the same challenges exist around versioning. One of the most challenging aspects of an API, keeping an, eye, an API um, current, is to handle the versioning issues. So how do I handle interface versioning um, and that's true of events perhaps more so because if you're going to rely on the event history then you're going to be able, you're going to need to know which version for example of a data schema the events were stored as so you either need to store the uh, version of the schema alongside the individual events which is one option um, or you need to provide a translation facility such that as you move to a new version where possible, the events are translated automatically for you. You might need to keep both of those available for different types of applications. So there could be some really subtle issues that you need to deal with around versioning, and it would be nice to abstract those 
from the back-end system and simplify those for the consumers of events. And so again, we're back to you know something that a event management system could usefully do in the middle um, <clears throat> as, a, as a facility that's used in a decentralized way. So that's taken us through a fair number of, of different um, aspects of, of what event management might look for look, look like. Um, as, as I say, I think we're moving to, towards not just um, events, but perhaps a, sort of this idea of a multi-form API. So an API that's made up of, um, of RESTful APIs, events, various other different protocols as well. And we're going to start to see more of these things coming to the surface. And so you know, what we think of as API management today needs to have a, a different flavor in the future. Now, whilst I've left up a, a, a list of various different references for you to, to take a look at, um, the slides should be down, made down available to you. Uh, I'm just going to take a look back at the questions. Um, uh, out of Kafka protocols, WebSockets, webhooks, which are the best and easy to use and customize in open source? Um, so there, great question. Um, I think it's fair to say that WebSockets are, uh, sorry, webhooks are a bit of a favorite at the moment because they're easier to implement, at least initially. Um, but they have many downsides in terms of reliability and they, it, they don't enable you, for example, to see things like the event history. So in terms of ease of use, we're seeing a lot of use of, of, of webhooks. Um, <clears throat> WebSockets is a, is a somewhat lower level implementation. It takes a bit more programming skill and knowledge and knowledge of frameworks and things to, to make use of WebSockets. Um, you can expose whatever you want over a WebSocket, so it kind of leaves the door open a bit. It's almost, WebSockets is almost like the equivalent of knowing that you've got HTTP as a protocol, but then how do you want to use it? Do you want to do web services? Do you want to do REST? Do you want to do whatever? So WebSockets is quite a low-level protocol, and you then have to decide what you're using on top of that. Kafka um, is a very popular um, as a way of exposing event history. Um, but we're not seeing Kafka protocol being used much outside the enterprise boundary. So it's often used um, within uh, an enterprise to expose things, within an, within an application, sorry, to expose things to different microservices within the same application. It's often used to replicate data perhaps across to a different region of an organization using Kafka repl replication. Um, uh, or, or even just remote access to the streams themselves. But we're not seeing it used at edge of enterprise to expose um, streams that way. So that's the challenge we have at the moment, is what is a good way of exposing event streams but beyond the edge of the enterprise? Now, it's not to say it's not, not possible to do. I mean, you can access Kafka via REST APIs rather than over the Kafka protocol, for example. Those various companies have uh, implementations of a REST API layer over the top, and that's something that might be more feasible to expose outside the enterprise. Um, but it's still, it's very rare to see that happen because the Kafka, the, the granularity and the uh, of the Kafka protocol is quite deep. Um, so it's quite a high learning curve. So watch this space, I think, is the answer as to what's going to happen in a few years. But hopefully that's given you some flavor as to what the different capabilities are there. Um, I can paste all the links for you, yes, into the chat. I'll happily do that. You will be able to get hold of uh, the PDF too. Um, but I will happily um, uh, place those links in the chat. I'll do that now while we're talking. Um, and then I'll then have a look, see what other questions we might have. Uh, there we go. Hopefully those come out in the chat okay. Um, that's interesting. I only seems to put the first one in, so I'll do them each individually. I'll just take a look at that last question. Um, what are webhooks, which are so popular? Yeah, so effectively, webhooks isn't, isn't actually particularly daring and, and, and difficult technology. It's really just a callback pattern um, using a URL. So you could effectively say, instead of me calling a REST service, I'm going to give that service 
a URL to call me. So I'm going to make a REST service available as a callback. Uh, and I'm going to give you the URL to that, and you call me back when you've got an event. So that's that's all a webhook really is. There's a little bit of structure around it and, and standards around it as to how it's done. Um, but that's essentially what it is. Right, so with that, um, uh, let's see. Uh, I've got a... Uh, I'll revisit the slide on CQRS uh, mistakes. Um, yes, happy to do that. I think you're probably referring to this one. Um, and I've gone back to it sharing, um, not in presentation mode this time, just so I can see the chat. Um, so yeah, what I was really getting at here, um, I mean, there's, if we wanted to talk about CQRS mistakes, there's, there's a bigger conversation to be had, and we don't have time for that probably. But I think probably the big warning bell was that it's complex. So make sure that you do have a need for the sort of things the CQRS pattern provides. That's if you're using it correctly within an application scope, which is what I'm showing on the left-hand side. Um, and then when you expose things outside of that application context, you expose them as APIs, and you don't make your event log visible if you can avoid that. Um, what I was getting at, though, with this slide was more about the fact that sometimes people think that they're doing CQRS when, in fact, they are doing something that looks like CQRS. It's got separate path for commands, and it's got a separate path for reads, uh, which is what you're seeing on the right-hand side. But actually, it's spread across multiple systems in an organization. Um, now, almost by definition, the CQRS pattern has to live within the bounded context of one application. That's, you know, you can't make it work if you're not doing that. So what's on the right-hand side of this diagram isn't really CQRS. It's still got many of the properties of CQRS. It's got asynchronous communication for the commands. Um, it's got read data stores um, to, to optimize the reads on particular things. But I think thinking, of, thinking that it is the CQRS pattern is a little dangerous because all the documentation about the CQRS pattern is targeted at application developers. And this is really more of an enterprise architecture problem um, on the right-hand side that needs to be handled differently and recognizing that there are different domains and, and organizations there. Um, so that's, yeah, I've just, just the, in the last few minutes, tried to sort of uh, revisit that slide. Um, I think I've got a few other um, links that I haven't yet uh, shared because it's only sharing one at a time, it seems. So I'll just quickly whip through those uh, as we go. I can see one of the questions uh, crept in there, um, which is, so Webhooks is, is like WebSockets and allows bi-directional communication. Um, I would say Webhooks is, is really a way of setting up a callback. So it's really, it, 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 although there are two directions involved, there's the initial registering of the Webhook, and then there's the later callbacks with the events, it's really a one-directional communication uh, in itself. Um, so it, it's, it, it's kind of a, a, a one-way communication. It's not setting up a socket where things could be passed back and forth. But of course, you know, if you've got, uh, if a company's made an API available and a webhook available, then 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 you've got two-way communication. Um, so so it depends what you're, um, you know, how much we add into the pattern. Um, right, just pasting these last few things in just to make sure you've all got them, should you need them. Um, and uh, happy to take any more questions as we finish off here. Okay, almost through them. Any more questions are very welcome, and I'll be wrapping up pretty soon. I see another question that's cracked in there. If a company has made an API available and then a webhook available, then we get to a communication. Can you elaborate please, further, please? So yes, I guess what I was getting at there was sort of to your earlier point. Um, so the webhook I would see as it's a one-way communication once established, 
um, because the uh, um, you know you've you've registered your callback URL and you're getting information on that callback URL. So that's you're just receiving events. Um, but of course, if you also need to be able to talk to that system that you registered the URL with, they could make an API available to you, and you could communicate over that route. So we're getting to a kind of convoluted example, but I like it, um, uh, and where you know you've got a combination of two different ways of exposing things. So that company's made a uh, an API available, so you can talk to them. They've also made a webhook available so that you can receive events from them. So it's sort of mixing and matching all the different options there. Thanks very much for these questions. It does it does help to know that somebody's out there when we're doing these virtual conferences at this time. Um, that's the last of the uh, links placed in there. Um, so if there's no other questions, um, oh, here we go. Um, can open APIs use webhooks also? Um, so the open API specification isn't the um, isn't the definition document used as such um, to describe webhooks. Um, uh, it, it, it's only designed to really describe a, a, REST, a, you know, a normal REST API. Um, um, and, um, and, and so webhooks themselves, you then have to define what the shape of the thing is that you're going to be sending back. So you could use some elements of the open API specification um, to describe the webhook um, and uh, you know, potentially also async API as well. Right, and with that, I think I'm, I'm quite over time. So I will stop at this point. Thank you very much for your, uh, your uh, participation today. Cheers. <laughs>